continue reading in the Word of God from 1 Samuel chapter 4. 1 Samuel chapter 4. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside Ebenezer. And the Philistines pitched in Aphek. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines, and they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. And when the people were come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh, that they might bring from thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the ark of the covenant of God. And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rang again. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was come into the camp. And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God is come into the camp. And they said, unto, and they, and they said Woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing heretofore. Woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Be strong and quit yourselves like men, O ye Philistines, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews as they have been to you. Quit yourselves like men and fight. And the Philistines fought. And Israel was smitten, and they fled every man into his tent, and there was a very great slaughter. For there fell of Israel thirty thousand footmen, and the ark of God was taken. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. There ran a man of Benjamin out of the army and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes rent and with earth upon his head. And when he came, lo, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. And when Eli heard the noise of the crying, he said, What meaneth the noise of this tumult? And the man came in hastily and told Eli. Now Eli was ninety and eight years old, and his eyes were dim, but he could not see. And the man said unto Eli, I am he that came out of the army, and I fled today out of the army. And he said, What is there done, my son? And the messenger answered and said, Israel is fled before the Philistines, and there hath been also a great slaughter among the people. And thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. And it came to pass, when he made mention of the ark of God, that he fell, off the, he fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck brake, and he died. For he was an old man and heavy, and he had judged Israel forty years. And his daughter-in-law, Phinehas's wife, was with child, near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken, and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not. For thou hast born a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken, and because of her father in law and her husband. And she said, The glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken saying, The glory is departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken, and because of her father-in-law and her husband, 
And she said, The glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. Well, in the last few days, we've heard about spiritual revival. We've had set before us the anatomy of what revival looks like, all the parts of revival, the prayer for revival, the preaching of revival, the marks or the fruits of revival. This morning, we, in a sense, back up. We want to look at the context of revival, the times in which revival happens. If we've looked at the anatomy of spiritual revival, this morning we're going to look at the anatomy of spiritual declension. The times that cry out for for the presence and the glory of God to come and to settle down on the people of God once more. Where is the glory? That's the question this morning. Where is the glory? That's really comprehended in that one word, Ichabod. The glory has departed, or it can be phrased in a question, where is the glory? This really is the impetus to pray for revival, this question. Where is the glory of God? Where is the presence of God? Is He not concerned about His glory anymore? Does God not care about His church? Does not God not care about the world in which we live, a world that is sunken in spiritual darkness, a church that is sliding into spiritual darkness? Seminaries that are sliding into spiritual darkness and, and liberalism. In 1 Samuel 4, Israel faced her enemies and had to come to wrestle with this question, where is the glory of God? If that's a statement that hung over Israel in times of spiritual declension, surely it's a statement that hangs over us as a church, as families, as a nation. I pray this morning that we would use this passage as a time of of spiritual reflection, of spiritual self-examination, of corporate self-examination, even of national self-examination. As we come to wrestle with this question, where is the glory, we would be driven to pray, Lord, come again. Lord, do it again for thy name. Lift up thy glory in a, in a godless and secular and immoral age, an age that has affected the church, that is affecting the people of God. What led to this question or this statement in the first place in the life of Israel? If we back up in the history of Israel, we read in the Judges, conclusion of the judges that every man did what was right in his own eyes, for there was no king in Israel. There was a vacuum of spiritual leadership in the nation of Israel. Now we read through the book of Ruth how God comes in the, the lives of ordinary people and he promises a redeemer, he promises a king. The book of Ruth ends with Obed, but also the name of David. And then we have 1 Samuel, a woman who is childless, hopeless. God gives Samuel, and then Hannah sings a beautiful song, a song that is remarkable in in tracing the redemptive history of God, the providence of God, how God raises up one and brings down another to bring redemption to his people. That's the principle we see operating in the books of Samuel and Kings. God brings down Eli, raises up Samuel to bring the word of God. God brings down Saul and raises up David, his anointed, to bring salvation to Israel through the promised seed of David, a royal seed, the promise that not one would depart from the throne forever. Culminating, of course, in Jesus Christ. And so the times of Israel are times of spiritual declension. 
And in the first place this morning, we see that Israel, in its spiritual declension, begins to manipulate the glory of God, the presence of God. Let's first define what we mean by the glory of God. The glory of God simply means the heaviness of God, the presence of God. Children, you know During Israel's history, as they traveled through the wilderness, what was the symbol of God's presence, of God's glory? It was the cloud of, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, wasn't it? It came to settle on the tabernacle where God dwelt, symbolic of God's presence, of God's redeeming and saving presence with Israel. Right above the the Ark of the Covenant, symbolic of the presence and the glory, the weightiness, the, the, the heaviness of the presence of God. 1 Samuel 4, 1 indicates that Israel's spiritual demise and the departure of the glory of God had already begun. That God had distanced Himself from, from the children of Israel because the children of Israel had distanced themselves from God. In the day and age in which we live, sometimes we ask the question, where is God? Where has God moved? We need to ask the question first that comes first, where have we moved? Where have we moved from God? That's what we see in the life of Israel. The phrase there, the word of Samuel came to all Israel, indicates that God had spoken to Israel through the mouth of the prophet Samuel. But from that point on, the word of Samuel or the the word of the Lord is silent until Eli and his sons and their spiritually toxic leadership has ended, divinely removed from the scene of Israel, and the ark of God returns back to the house of Abinadab. And so the silence of the word of God in the following verses is a symptom. It's a symptom of the departure of the glory of God. The lesson for us today is this, the the silencing or the twisting or the ignoring or the minimizing of the Word of God, of God's self-revelation to His people is, is a sure way to know that the glory of God has departed or is on its way out because we have removed ourselves from listening and hearing and obeying the Word of God in its entirety. The presence of God is on the way out of the church when the church pushes the Word of God to the fringes of the church. And the church turns to a self-help gospel. Indeed, the commonplace practice of seeking God's will before battle in the life of Israel was circumvented as Israel faced off with the Philistines. It used to be that they waited for the Word of the Lord. But now... They go immediately into battle in verse 2. The Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. When they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines. They slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. They set aside the word of God. They set aside the voice of the Lord, and they went into battle in their own strength, and they failed miserably. The word of God was silent. But the hand of God was not inactive as he brought defeat to Israel. The silence of the word of God continues in 1 Samuel 28. The pattern repeats itself in the life of Saul. God had come to Saul with the word of the Lord through the prophet Samuel. But in his last days, Saul sets aside that word and he he turns to the witch of Endor to to seek revelation, to to hear the voice of Samuel again from from the grave. Desperately tries to determine the will of God before battle. But he turns not to the word of the Lord, but to a word from hell. This way of living apart from the word of God leads to defeat, to spiritual defeat, to spiritual declension. A lack of dependence on the word and the will of the Lord leads to spiritual defeat for the people of God. That's sobering, isn't it? And then Israel attempts to diagnose their problems by asking this question in verse 3. A great question, by the way. Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today 
before the Philistines? Why is the church being defeated before the hand of the enemy? Why is the church being weakened, at least in the Western context in which we live? Israel rightly identified the fact that the Lord had smitten them. They asked the question, why? A good question. They still had that sense of, of God consciousness. Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us? But they misused this to, to blame the Lord, to assign blame to God for defeat. They asked the right question. But they assigned the blame in the wrong place. They fatally depended on their own strength and then wonder where the Lord's Strength and power has gone, have, have gone. The sad reality was that this excellent question remains unanswered in Israel's history at this point, and they turn to pragmatism rather than prayer. And beloved, if we learn anything in the past several days, it's that prayer is central for God to revive His people, not pragmatism. They turn to pragmatism instead of prayer, to pragmatism instead of repentance and return to the Lord whom they had left, whom they had turned from, whom they had departed from. That's a warning for us, isn't it? We should not leave this question unanswered for ourselves, for our church, for our families, for our individual lives, for the wider culture in which we, in which we live. It's a powerful question that gets to the root of the problem if we let the Word of God diagnose our problem instead of turning to pragmatism. Why has the Lord smitten us? Let the weight of that reality set in. Let us not turn to pragmatism, but let us turn to humbling ourselves before God in prayer. Just like we heard yesterday how, how Edwards and the church in the 18th century used the absence of revival, the, the absence of the heightened activity of the Spirit to, to lead to self-reflection. Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us? Why is God not working in our day? It led them to renewed seeking of God to come in His presence and to work again. This question ought to lead us in a lifestyle of repentance and tenderness and humility of heart before the Lord. Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us? It's on account of our sin, isn't it? On account of our lukewarmness, our lack of reliance upon the Word, the self-revelation of God. The glory of God begins to depart from the church when the church no longer gives heed to the Word of God. The elders of Israel did not answer this question. They formed their own pragmatic agenda. They begin to manipulate the glory, the presence of God. In verse 3, they determined to take the ark of the covenant of the Lord to themselves as if the ark had some talismanic power. And children, maybe you wonder, what, what is a talisman? What is a talisman? Well, in the world of soccer... Maybe some of you have heard of Lionel Messi. He's often referred to the talisman of his team, the man who is at the center of his team, who can turn the game around with one single move and bring victory to his side. That's how Israel viewed the ark of God as a talisman, as something that could, could turn the tide of the war, the battle in which they were, if they could only bring the, the ark into the middle of the battle, they could, they could turn the war in their favor. They could turn the tie. They could, they could have the victory. The emphasis on the ark, not on the Lord himself. Maybe they recalled the victories during the conquest of the land of Canaan as the ark of, of God, as the ark of glory, as the ark of the presence of God was, was carried around Jericho and those, those mighty walls fell as, as the presence of God was there. The Philistines have certainly heard those stories of God's intervention as He went up amongst the Israelites, leading them from Egypt. That's what we read in verse 6 and 7. 
the reputation of the God of Israel had gone before him. Even the heathen lands around Israel knew about God and his power. But here Israel is blinded. And they think that if they bring, simply bring the ark of God into the middle of the battle, they can, they can turn the tide. They can set aside God as long as they have the ark. Maybe they thought they could recreate that history and the power they had once experienced. They thought they could manipulate the glory of the Lord and bend the power of God to suit their own agenda, to suit their own will, to achieve victory for themselves. This is a temptation for the church today, isn't it? To take the power of God, to take the presence of God, to take the things of God, and to twist it to our own advantage, to manipulate it. So often we look to the past. and We want to replicate the history of the past. We heard of the past yesterday, of God's work in the past, in the Old Testament, the New Testament, in the 18th century revivals that took place right in this region. And the temptation is that we want to recreate the past. We want the power. We want, the, we want to see something of the effects of spiritual revival. But we set aside the God who brings revival. In our attempts to replicate history, we can inadvertently deny the glory of God and turn to a pragmatic agenda to recreate that history. Dr. Neely made the quip that if we just set up the tent outside, we can have the revival meeting. As if God needs a, a tent and a revival meeting to bring revival. We can't turn to pragmatic solutions and agendas to, to recreate and to call down the presence and the power of God. No, we need to humble ourselves before God in prayer. We need to pray for God to raise up men who are, who are full of zeal and the Spirit of God to preach, to hold nothing back, but to preach the full counsel of God. To preach faithfully and fervently as we saw in the life of Edwards. To pray fervently as we saw from the prophet Habakkuk. There's a danger that we can turn to pragmatic solutions and agendas and attribute talismanic power to those things. As if revival comes through a program rather than through prayer and preaching of the Word of God. Spirit-filled preaching and prayer. We can never harness and direct the power of God for our own ends. That's what we're learning from this, this sad and dark narrative. When we do that, we end up manipulating the glory of God like the Israelites did leaning on externals instead of the God that was symbolized by the externals. We no longer long for the glory of God to fill the earth and change our hearts. We begin to long for the glory of God to change only our circumstances like the Israelites. They wanted a victory. In our minds, we place the power of God in the repository of political power, perhaps in legislative victories, in material prosperity, in the blessings that God gives us. And we use these as indicators of God's presence and God's glory. We begin to manipulate those things as if we can call down the power of God through these things. And these things are not wrong in and of themselves. We need that. To maintain a sense of morality, a sense of a moral compass in our culture. But if we are longing for revival, we need to learn that we cannot manipulate the glory and the presence and the power of God. In his commentary, Dale Ralph Davies says it well. He says, whenever the church stops confessing thou art worthy and starts chanting thou art useful, well, then you know the ark of God has been captured again. My friends, how do we view the Lord? 
this morning? Do we view him as worthy? Do we fall down before this sovereign God that we heard of? This gracious God? Or do we call out to God and say, Lord, you are useful. Come and and work here and here and here. Are we manipulating the glory of God for our own ends? Or are we praying for God to come and to work in his own way, in his own time, because he is worthy? We need to beware. Lest we manipulate the glory of God and the glory of God is captured and and carried away and God departs from his people. That's what we see in the second thought, the glory captured. Israel's manipulation of the glory of the Lord did not bode well for them as they carried the ark. As you read verse 4, there's every indication that they had missed the true significance of the ark. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims. The very God of heaven dwelt between those cherubims that were on top of the ark. His presence was there. But then we read this. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. The presence of God is replaced by the presence of two men who were wicked spiritual leaders. You sense the irony. They manipulate the glory of God and they miss the true significance that the Lord of the armies sits between the cherubims. The very God they needed, they ignored. They force the throne from out from under the Lord's feet and they assert their own power. And what do we read? Who do we read is present with the ark? It's Hophni and Phinehas, hardly the epitome of divine glory. And as the ark is brought into the heat of the battle, the Philistines understood the significance of the ark. They're brought to fear and exclamation in verse 8. Woe unto us! Who shall deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? God's reputation had preceded the ark and the army of the Israelites. Ironically, it would be this very God who would give the Philistines relief from the Israelites. Not because God favored the Philistines. But because he's the Lord of hosts, he's the Lord of the armies, he's in control. He is the Lord of glory who will not share his glory with mortal man. The Lord grants victory to to the Philistines that day. The ark is taken captive to Ashdod. Israel is put to rout before the Philistines despite their best efforts to manipulate the presence and the glory of God. The Philistines understand the reality behind the ark. They realize their, their insignificance and utter inability to win the battle against the Lord. At this point, the Israelites were further ahead than the Israelites in their understanding of what the ark meant. They understood the significance of the power and the glory of the Lord through the symbol of the ark. It caused fear and consternation on their part. But they take courage and they fight. And the Lord directs the armies, the battle. And Israel is defeated. Maybe we ask the question, why would God allow Israel to be defeated? Why would he allow his glory to be put on the line? So that Israel would turn back to him. So that Israel would realize what they had done in in the symbol of the presence of God departing from Israel and being captured by the Philistines. So Israel might come again to worship God in, in light of his glory, his weightiness, crying out for his presence again in a real way. We see this operating today as well, don't we? Sometimes the enemy... The enemies of God understand more of the power and glory of the Lord than the church itself. They're pressed down with a sense of his weightiness, more so than those who are on, supposed to be on God's side of this spiritual conflict. 
And sometimes the Lord allows the enemy to win a battle so that his people come to understand again the weightiness, the necessity of the presence of God to come and work again in times of spiritual declension. To live in dependence on him again. As we look around us, the circumstances are grim and dark. Let us remember. Let us remember that you and I need God. That God is in it for his glory, even when it seems that the enemy seems to capture and carry away the glory of God and suppress the work of God in the world. Partly because of our own foolishness as Christians in a church. We need to remember that God will receive the glory one way or another. He will not leave His people in church alone, but God is working, isn't He? Even through dark circumstances, even through times of pressure, even through times of spiritual declension, it's particularly in that context that God will come and work again. He will work in ways that seem contradictory and surprising. We heard that again and again over the last few days. The surprising work of God is is revival. In times when it seems that God has departed from His church, that God doesn't care about His glory, God comes and surprises His church. But do we as His church recognize the need for God to come again? Are we examining ourselves like they've done in church history? Are we confessing ways in which we have manipulated the glory of God? Are we coming back to rightly estimate our need of the presence of God? And so it seemed like utter defeat for the Israelites and for the Lord of glory is actually a potent reminder that the glory of the Lord cannot be manipulated. And it cannot be captured or carried off because God is sovereign. Here again, we have the sovereignty of God, don't we? Maybe we've grown up in a context in which the sovereignty of God was a huge roadblock to to spiritual life and to spiritual work within our own hearts. But the sovereignty of God is, is our friend. If God was not sovereign, this story would end in utter defeat and hopelessness. But God is sovereign. He will not allow His glory to be manipulated and carried off by the enemy. God will come again. God will come again. But we see here also that the glory of God is misplaced. The sad reality of this episode in Israel's history is that God is at work in removing the corrupt leadership of His worship. In order to reinstate the right worship of His glory, as you read the Song of Hannah, we, we, read that princi- we, we heard of that principle, didn't we, of, of one coming down and another being raised up by God. Here we have Eli being removed by God and his sovereignty, his his wicked sons being removed from the worship of Israel, and Samuel being instated as the leader of spiritual worship in Israel, as the one who would anoint the man after God's own heart. The story of Eli and his sons is really the, the microcosm, the small picture of what's happening on a large scale in the nation of Israel at large. It's a sobering reality, one that the prophet Hosea would would once again diagnose in Israel's later history, in Hosea 4, verse 10. Let's turn there for a moment. Hosea 4, verses 1 through 10. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood touches blood. Therefore shall the land mourn, and every one that dwelleth therein shall languish with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven. Yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. Yet let no man strive nor reprove another. For thy people are as they that strive with the priest. There thou sh- therefore shalt thou fall in the day, and the prophet also shall fall with thee in the night, and I will destroy thy mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law 
of thy God. I will also forget thy children. As they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore will I change their glory into shame. They eat up the sin of my people, and they set their heart on their iniquity. And there shall be like people, like priest. And I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their doings. For they shall eat and not have enough. They shall commit whoredom and shall not increase because they have left off to take heed to the Lord. An indictment of spiritual declension. Not just in the people, but also in the priests. What the Lord indicts here, he's also indicting in the lives of Hophni and Phinehas. Sadly, also making a statement about the life of Eli, their father. We find Eli anxiously awaiting news from the front in verses 12 through 18. We read that his heart trembled on account of the ark of God. He knew that God was going to punish his sons for their sins in leading the hearts of Israel astray in the worship of God. They had perverted and misplaced the glory of the Lord, centered it in their own pleasures. The description of Eli here only adds to the irony of this history, confirms that the glory of the Lord had been misplaced, centered in the satisfaction of fleshly lusts and desires. As the messenger comes and he relays the news of the defeat of Israel in verse 13, the capture of the ark and the death of Hophni and Phinehas, Eli falls over, breaks his neck, and dies. His sons, who had caused him no small amount of grief, are dead. The glory of the Lord was departed from Israel because he and his sons had misplaced the glory of the Lord at the heart of Israel's worship. They had made it about man. They had made it about the satisfaction of the lusts of the flesh. They had eaten what they wanted from the altar. They had left off God's prescription for Israel's worship. They had their choice of, of women that came to the altar, introducing pagan fertility elements into the worship of the glory of God. God had visited Eli through Samuel already prior to what happened here and informed Eli that God would raise up a priest faithful to himself, Samuel. It's an indictment of Eli and his sons. The fulfillment fulfillment of God's word is, is visibly established as word comes to Eli's ears. There's irony in this statement as Eli falls to the ground and dies. He was an old man and heavy, we read in verse 18. The word heavy here is the verbal form of the Hebrew kavod or glory. There's a play on words here. The glory of the Lord is misplaced. The glory of the Lord was exchanged and misplaced and wrapped around Eli's belly. It's a play on words used to demonstrate what happens when the people of God leave off the word of God and exchange the glory of God for the worship of the creature. It's not a sentence passed on Eli's eternal state, but it certainly is a sentence passed on Eli's sad spiritual condition. The glory of God was wrapped around his stomach. He was a heavy man. We don't know whether Eli participated in the the sins of his sons. But as the head of his family, the leader of Israel, the leader of Israel, and having to give Israel a sense of the weightiness of God certainly speaks powerfully to the weaknesses that that Eli displays here and carried over to the next generation. 
If it's not an indictment of Eli, it's certainly an indictment of Hophni and Phinehas. This is what Paul picks up on in Philippians 3, 18, and 18 through 20. He says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Eli's sons were enemies of the cross. They were enemies of the atonement pictured on the mercy seat of the ark. They had lived for themselves. They had turned their glory into shame. Their God was their belly. They minded earthly things. They had misplaced the glory of the Lord in pursuing their own pleasures. We're not immune to these sins, are we? Where are we placing the weightiness of the Lord? Are we willing to exchange the glory of in? of the incorruptible God for the fading glory of corruptible things? Are we exchanging the worship of the Creator for the worship of the creature? We certainly live in a day that only enhances this temptation. It's written for our warning, isn't it, that we do not misplace the glory of God in the the pursuits of, of the flesh to call ourselves to repentance if this is indeed the direction of our lives, to call the church to repentance, to call the wider culture to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, the one who is the full revelation of the glory of God. Beloved, let's beware lest we misplace the glory of God in the pursuits of earthly pleasures like the spiritual leadership here in Israel. Remember what Hosea said, as the people, so the priest. The spiritual leadership is a reflection of the people of Israel. That puts a special onus on spiritual leaders as well. We ought to be men of self-control, men who are concerned for the glory of the Lord, men who cry out and lead the people of God in the search for this glory again. Rather than wrapping the glory of God around ourselves and pursuing earthly pleasures. And then we read the sad conclusion of this narrative, the glory departed. The glory was manipulated. The glory was captured by the Philistines. The glory of the Lord was was misplaced. And now the glory of the Lord departs. The conclusion of this chapter is fascinating. Phinehas' widow comes into focus here, a woman who has endured the abuse and the promiscuity of her husband as he lived for himself within the tabernacle. The news of her husband's death, her brother-in-law's death, and her father-in-law's death reaches her ears. The news of the captured glory reaches her ears and the weightiness of what has happened settles in. She bears down in labor and gives birth and she dies. But she doesn't die until she names her child Ichabod. Where is the glory? Or the statement, the glory has departed. In her last moment, she understands and she feels the vacuum and the oppressing weightiness of a future without the glory of God in the midst of Israel. The naming of her child is a testament to the fact, to this fact, and a dark foreboding of Israel's next several years of living without the favorable presence of God. Notice that she doesn't say in the final analysis that the glory was captured. She says the glory has departed. Indicates that God's glory is not passive. It's not subject to to man's manipulation. It's not subject even to the enemy's supposed capturing of the glory of the Lord. 
But here again, the sovereignty of God comes to the foreground. The glory has departed. God has departed from Israel because Israel has departed from God. It's sovereignly withdrawn. But it's in those words that we find hope this morning. Because if it's God who sovereignly withdraws His presence, it is God who can also bring His presence again, His glory. If the glory cannot be manipulated or captured by man, then the glory can also return and the Lord's presence can again be known and felt. In this picture of spiritual declension, there is, there is, there is darkness. There is sin, but there's also hope that emerges from, from the naming of Phinehas' son. And this name, Ichabod. If he sovereignly withdraws himself in his good pleasure, he can also return in his good pleasure. His withdrawal is not arbitrary, nor is it permanent. Let's remember that. That is what this history is highlighting. Yes, Israel had declined into darkness, spiritual darkness and lethargy, so that they, they, they discounted the glory of God. They manipulated the glory of God. They misplaced the glory of God, so that it seemed that the, the glory of God was captured. In spite of the spiritual declension, God is still sovereign. That's what we need to remember in our day and our age. That we, see soft, so that we see spiritual declension all around us. The glory and the presence of the Lord are not subject to human manipulation. The Lord withdraws His glory to show His sovereignty. That He will not leave His people alone. It's an awful reality for the Lord to depart with His glory. But we need to remember that He withdraws His glory to draw us back to Himself in dependence on Him and His Word and His power to revive us and to worship Him properly. He withdraws Himself to call us to faithfulness within our families, within the ministry of the church as we see reflected in the warning of Eli and his sons. In a sense... The conclusion of this narrative leaves us with an emptiness and a darkness that can only be filled with the full revelation of God's glory in Jesus Christ. The withdrawal of God's presence leads us to consider the return of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's where this narrative leaves us, with a large gaping hole in the history of redemption. Who is going to come and deliver Israel from their spiritual declension? A king is coming, the man after God's own heart, David. And through David, Christ is coming. In another time of spiritual declension in the in the captivity of Israel in the land of Babylon. What did Isaiah prophesy? Isaiah 40, verse 5. We read these beautiful words. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. A prophecy of the coming king to turn around the prospects for his people. Where is the glory of the Lord? It's coming. It has come in Jesus Christ. That's what we're convinced of this morning through the Word of God. That's what the Apostle John anticipated as he writes of the coming Jesus. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Beloved, this is who God is. He will not leave his people in spiritual declension. And so we learn to examine ourselves, but we also learn to place our hope in the God of all glory who comes in the person of his Son. Again, in the preaching of the gospel this morning, 
to awaken us to our need of Him, the One who has come as the the transcript, the full reflection of the glory of the Father. And so this story, this narrative is one of warning and self-examination, but it's also one of encouragement. This morning I want to leave you with these lessons of warning and encouragement for what lies ahead for us as the church of Jesus Christ. Seven warnings and encouragements. First, there's a warning for us from this narrative that the glory of God will depart when we depart from the revealed will of God. It's a warning. The glory of God departs and we depart from the revealed will of God. Secondly, another warning. The glory of God, the power of God, cannot be manipulated by pragmatic solutions and programs and ideas and humanistic philosophies. We heard in the last several days that God begins to work in response to the prayers of His people. He works through the preaching of His servants. That is God's agenda for revival. So let's not turn to our own solutions. Don't let this question, where is the glory of the Lord, bring us to our own strength. But back again to the sovereignty of God, to that submissive silence before God for Him to work in our hearts, in our families, in our churches. But there's also an encouragement here, thirdly. The glory of God, as we heard, while seeming to be captured by the spiritual enemy, will not be brought captive to any enemy, but will come again. And it has come in Jesus Christ. And we can cry out then to God to come again. And then fourthly, there is another warning. The defeat of Israel and Eli and his sons indicates that God will not be trifled with. So often we bring God down to our level. And like Dale Ralph Davies says, we try to make God useful for us. But God uses this history to point out that He will remove corrupt leadership in order for His glory to return. The sins and weaknesses of Eli and his sons highlight their insufficiency to be the repositories of God's glory. And so we do not turn to man or the sons of man. The right of being the repository of God's glory belongs to Jesus Christ alone And we're called to be reflectors of that glory. So let's never think that we can capture the glory of God and pretend that we are the glory of God. Fifthly, there's another warning. The glory of God can sadly be exchanged for the glory of the incorruptible creature. This narrative warns us of that. Romans 1 warns us of that as well. Certainly we're living in that day, isn't it? Where the glory of God is exchanged for the glory of the creature. Let's beware. Lest we be brought captive to such thinking and such living. And God departs from His church. Sixthly, sixthly, there's another warning. The departure of the glory of God has weighty consequences. Sin, when it has brought forth, brings forth death. Or sin, when it has conceived, brings forth death. We see that in this narrative. Spiritual declension ends in spiritual death if there is no repentance and turning to God. Then lastly and seventhly, there's an encouragement. 
the sovereign departure of the glory of the Lord also speaks of the return of the glory of the Lord in its fullness. It anticipates the coming of Jesus. It anticipates the cross of Jesus, as we'll hear this afternoon. It anticipates the resurrection of Jesus, the glorification, the crowning of Jesus, and the second coming of Jesus. It anticipates the work of redemption that is coming through the Son. And so we look back and we see the glory of the Lord has come in Jesus Christ and it encourage us, encourages us to pray again with renewed zeal, with renewed humiliation before God to come and to work, to lift up himself and his son in our midst. And so in conclusion, where is the glory? Where is the glory? It is in Jesus Christ. Let us pray for that glory never to depart, but to come more fully with greater power so we might with greater delight, delight in Jesus Christ, that we might love him more fully and deny ourselves that we might decrease and he might increase. The worship of God would be purified and established again in our day. That the people of God would be revived. That the glory of God would once again be manifest in the preaching, in the prayers, in the life of the people of God. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank Thee for Thy Word. Yes, Lord, we thank Thee even for Thy challenging Word. For without the challenges of Thy Word, we'd never be led to examine ourselves and we'd be brought to think that everything is fine. But Lord, we've read of spiritual declension. We've read of the departure of the Lord from the nation of Israel. But Lord, we return to Thee this morning and pray that Thou will not depart from us that we would use this passage to examine our hearts and our lives and come to hope again in the only one who is the repository of thy glory in Jesus Christ. There is no other hope, no other life than that which is bound up in Jesus Christ, the one whom thou hast glorified and will glorify again when he comes on the clouds. Lord, we cry out with the bride, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Manifest thy glory once more, Lord, in this this world, in our hearts, in this church, in all of our churches, that thou wilt come again. Lift up thy son, glorify him once more, we pray. We ask thee to bless our fellowship today. I ask thee to bless our, our communion with one another. Bless Dr. Neely as he brings thy word this afternoon that we'd be refreshed once more. Lord, hear us, we pray, in the forgiveness of our sins. For Jesus' sake alone, amen. We'll sing Psalter 58. Psalter 58, a version of Psalm 24. We'll sing all verses.